So last up we have Dominic Cordell. You were you went to Miami? Yeah. Yeah. So he's a neurology resident and uh, did his med school in Miami. So he's going to talk about occipital lobe epilepsy. Okay. Awesome. Let me just pull this up. So Dr. Degree called last night and had me make this more appropriate for this audience. So hopefully I don't put you guys to sleep. She says, too much neurology in it. <laughs> so I'm going to talk today about um, distinguishing visual symptoms from occipital lobe epilepsy from visual symptoms we see in migraine. And to illustrate this uh, case report, I'm a patient who I saw in the neurology wards who was seen in the neuro ophthalmology clinic. So it was a 51-year-old right-handed lady. Um, she had a history of obesity, hypertension, and uh, acephalgic migraine with visual aura. She presented to the emergency room with five months of progressively worsening paroxysmal episodes that included her visual hallucinations but were now followed by nausea, vomiting, headache, and imbalanced gait, um, and some complaints of her vision moving, sort of bouncy vision. Um, she decided to come in that day because she'd had a couple of these episodes in a row and thought they were becoming increasingly frequent and severe. That precipitated her presentation that day. Um, and she described, she wasn't quite sure, but at least 20 years of having these visual symptoms that at onset were not associated with any sort of headache or any other neurologic symptoms. Um, but she described them as brief round uh, lights that would appear, uh, it seemed like in both fields of vision, at least in both eyes, it will last seconds to minutes. Her past medical and ophthalmologic history was pretty unremarkable. She had had a history of endometrial adenocarcinoma that was resected. Um, otherwise, in that, no eye disease in herself um, or her family. She was sort of a normal functioning uh, person. She was a cook at a restaurant, had a normal developmental history, um, and not really any other uh, relevant medical or surgical history. So her basic exam, she had normal visual acuity. Her pupils were normal, no, no afferent defect. Her extraocular movements were full. Color testing was normal. She did have uh, quite a few misses uh, in terms of depth perception with the circle test. Her uh, slit lip exam was largely normal. She did have some temporal pallor uh, when you looked at her optic nerves bilaterally, but she had a normal uh, fusion flicker test. Her neuro exam was largely unremarkable. She had maybe some prolonged, um, took her a while to extinguish and gaze nystagmus, maybe eight beats, a little bit more than we'd expect physiologically, but all the other um, provoking maneuvers to elicit any kind of peripheral nerve or vestibular problem were unremarkable. And she had no other cranial nerve or focal <clears throat> neurologic findings. And I have to say these were sort of intraictal exams, so this is, was not when she was having her symptoms. So she underwent an MRI, and to everyone's surprise, had this relatively striking abnormality, and she had never had neuroimaging before. And so this is um, called coplocephaly, and it's describing the asymmetric dilatation of her uh, posterior motor lateral ventricles. And it's actually defined radiographically um, that this posterior um, axial length should be two to three times as large as her anterior horn. Um, this is normally found in pediatric patients, usually in the workup of other developmental abnormalities. Um, so it's very rare. I think there's only two or three case reports of this being actually found in, in uh, otherwise normal humans. Um, in the literature, I think the cases often, the two that I could find present with sort of migraineous or epilepsy-like symptoms. Um, but usually in kids, there can be other um, abnormalities particularly the midline structures, the corpus callosum, uh, along the spectrum of sort of a septo-optic dysplasia. So um, it's thought that this is not a, uh, this is actually a congenital abnormality. This patient had this for years. It's more, people think it has to do more with uh, problems with the morphogenesis in those regions, not necessarily destruction of tissue or injury. Um, and it's associated with a lot of genetic uh, and chromosomal abnormalities. Again, it's something she's had since she was a child. So the question was, given her symptoms and her newly found abnormal neuroanatomy, were these visual symptoms more consistent with a, with a migraine or with a septal lobe seizure? And so this has been discussed uh, really in the late 90s by a Greek neurologist, Pena Tropolis, probably saying that incredibly wrong. 
he wrote a series of papers, and he was focused on the um, differentiating migraine with visual aura and basilar migraine from occipital lobe seizures in mostly the adolescent population. Uh, there's a benign occipital lobe epilepsy that is really responsive to carbamazepine, but often these kids would get misdiagnosed and not be treated for years. So his argument is that the visual symptoms in occipital lobe epilepsy are distinguishable based on the patient's description. The complicating factor is that in these occipital lobe seizures, you can often have headache, uh, post as long as, as well as nausea and vomiting. So uh, in order to tease these two apart can be quite difficult clinically. But his description of the, of the elementary visual hallucinations seen in occipital lobe epilepsy, um, he thought were fairly characteristic. Um, these are, I think, six um, patient renderings of their uh, visual symptoms during a seizure. Um, they're predominantly colored and round and involve at least circular shapes. They're very typical in the semiology so that the visual symptoms will be the same pretty much every, uh, every time they have them. Obviously, the progression to non-visual symptoms, which would represent you know, migration of the seizure or generalization of the seizure, were highly suggestive of uh, an occipital lobe epilepsy. Um, and the other thing he found was that these typically are, are much shorter, simply in the realm of seconds, maybe a minute, in the extreme three minutes long, um, which is contrasted to what we see in migraine. I think we all know that the typical features of a migraine or or are skin and scotoma, shown in these corner, or these top two windows. These usually are associated with the scotoma. They can progress and sort of move to the periphery. Um, they can present with fortification spectra or pr progress to that, which is shown by those sort of bright zigzag lines. Um, they can leave residual uh, scotomas after they're gone. And phosphines are also reported, which are just bright flashes of light, which can move across the visual field and are quite sure as well. But typically, these are, the onset and the progression of these last many minutes, at least one, but usually up to at least half an hour. That can be helpful in distinguishing these from um, these simple low visual hallucinations. So in terms of this treatment, she was um, admitted. She had a lumbar puncture because everyone was in the emergency room was at least convinced she had an acute hydrocephalus. Her opening pressure was obviously normal. We hooked her up to continuous EEG and indeed found um, medium to large intermittent sharp waves uh, on the right occipital temporal area, which is actually where her copocephaly was worse. It was a bit asymmetric, um, which was very suggestive of focal seizure. She was started on Capra, um, which did improve her visual symptoms. She still had some residual headaches, so we eventually, as an outpatient, sw switched her to Topamax for sort of dual coverage. Um, and uh, not only did her visual symptoms improve, um, so did her uh, intermittent unsteadiness as well the EEG changes, uh, abnormalities disappeared. So in conclusion, I think, you know, based on her description, um, these obviously fit occipital lobe seizures and that's supported by the evidence seen with a structural abnormality on MRI imaging and uh, on EEG, which reversed with treatment. So these were probably a long-standing, you know, in, incorrectly attributed to, to acephalgic migraine with visual aura. Um, while th some suggest you can actually tease these apart based on clinical history, based on their symptom, the description of them being round, um, colored hallucinations that are relatively short in duration, um, sometimes this can be difficult to distinguish, largely just on how the patient can describe them. So obviously an EEG can be helpful when there's a question. And certainly in her case, if an EEG had been performed 20 years ago, I think the finding of, an, of a focal um, epilepsy would have led to an MRI, perhaps different treatment for her. And that's all I have, if there's any questions. Did you think the optic nerve pallor was just retrograde atrophy from the hypocephalus? Yeah, I kind of left out, there were some other um, other mild findings on her um, MRI as well. I don't think we saw anything in terms of optic nerve size or, you know, on the MRI, but I would assume that is. Um, actually, I thought I had a, this got deleted. I had a picture of her visual fields and she had a very mild, shallow left homonymous hemianus, yeah. Almost unappreciable, but, but maybe there. Did you do um, an 
there a five on there analysis? You know, we didn't. Just yeah, we didn't. Thanks for letting me talk.